Today is February 28th, 2015. Joining us on the porch are local musician Mark Warner and owner of Mother Earth Baby, Lisa Emmons. Yeah, that's right, folks. We are here back at the Wooden Apple Farmstead for another fun-filled, exciting episode of On the Porch Radio Hour. I'm your host, Matthew Wood, and of course, I am at the Wooden Apple Farmstead. I was almost not at the Wooden Apple Farmstead, as it normally goes on Thursdays. I've been spending a lot of time shoveling off roofs. You know, there was a chance that I was going to be stuck up on a roof earlier today. I was asked to shovel off a roof in the city of Oswego, and while I was there, I sometimes get sidetracked because it's we're getting close to spring, I believe it anyway, and there are some animals that believe it too, and I was watching some birds fly around. I sat down on the edge of the roof to, to pull some water out of my backpack when I saw what, what I thought at the time seemed like a larger than, than normal bird fly, uh, you know, just out of my periphery so I I spun real quick and as I spun to look at the bird I kicked the ladder and the ladder fell and so there I was sitting on this roof of a of a three-story building in the middle of Oswego I thought I would just enjoy the sun and just kind of hang out and I I did some more shoveling because that's why I was there and I figured I, I might as well I'm not going anywhere anytime soon I guess I can finish the job and I was also enjoying the sun though and I kept looking around and I thought I saw somebody that I knew. And so I, I peered down over the edge of, of the building, and there was Mark Warner. And Mark was just kind of hanging out, walking around, doing the, the, in the middle of Oswego, in the middle of a Thursday, uh, you know, just playing his guitar, walking around, hanging out, being a strolling minstrel. I thought, I thought that I could hear songs of youth and misspent youth sometimes but most of the songs were about the love and the joy of being young and as he walked by this building i saw a young woman walking behind him with a with a flute and she was playing the flute and there was a whole bunch of children surrounding them and there was Lisa Emmons and and she was calling all of these young children to her and she was explaining to them all of the wonders of all of these things and they all followed her they left Mark's side and they all followed her and her flute playing into her shop because that's what she does she takes care well she doesn't really take care of everybody's kids directly (laughs) but she takes care of everybody's kids because she owns this shop and that's what they do there they provide all sorts of cool stuff for kids and you know and kids parents too but it's mostly for the kids she's always doing really great things and so this all these lines of children were following her and i think that mark thought that that was great but i also think that mark was a little sad that he was losing his his crowd so he followed as well i was stuck on the roof and i kept yelling and one of the uh, one of the little tykes in the back of the crowd turned and looked and squinted and I thought for a second we made eye contact. Just for that moment, the child just turned and blindly followed the rest of the crowd. And I didn't know what to do until that crowd came back out and they had sewn together this massive tarp of cloth diapers and they were standing there. They'd come out of Mother Earth Baby and they had sewn this giant giant cloth diaper tarp and mark was singing songs and the children were singing along and it was a joyous moment and the sun was shining perfectly on all of these children with big smiles on their faces and their parents were standing around with big smiles on their faces and i said just raise the ladder and one of the children said no it's okay this is made out of three ply cotton we'll catch you it'll be fine and i said but it's going to get wet 
And then one of the children said, no, we've sewn the bottom half with all of our waterproof outers. It'll be okay. <laughs> and, and I had no choice. And right when Mark hit that final chord before the dramatic pause in a song, I knew it was my moment. And I dove, swan-like, I think, in appearance. And I floated gently into the softest, most giant cloth diaper I've ever seen or felt in my life. And it reminded me of the days when I was with my children and they were in cloth diapers. And we had this thing called the knife that we used to help clean out our diapers. And it was fantastic. And I wanted to be there. And then I thought, I am there in my own cloth diaper. And I wept. And my tears flowed until they were quickly absorbed. And I was happy. And I was powdered and creamed and sent on my way. And I've never been so comfortable in my life. <laughs> and I want to thank Mark for being part of that process. <laughs> and he fled. He fled. And I want to thank Lisa for being there and all of those children and all of the sewing that happened. And I assure you that it was done with love. I know sometimes when we hear about children sewing, it's not always in the nicest terms, but it was fantastic. And I think it was great. And I, and I want to thank them for being here. And I want to thank them for joining us on the show tonight. And we will be talking more uh, deeply with them later. But for now, Mark, you're on the porch. Hi, hey, Matt. Thanks. Um, I'm Mark Warner. It's an honor to be here to be asked to be here. I've uh, known a lot of the previous performers and guests and, uh, it's becoming an esteemed list. Thanks for having me. I'm going to do a couple songs tonight. The first is by a songwriter I really admire uh, named Tops Todd Snyder. A little out of time, a little out of tune, sort of lost in space, chasing that moon. I'm in the walls of a hurricane Still overall, I can't complain All I wanted was one chance Let freedom ring Said I had to get a permit Bunch of tax and everything Never made it through the red tape Got this paper hat Got a job working weekdays You want fries with that I got nothing to lose There's nothing to gain It's like a one-way ticket to cruise in the passing lane And I can't complain I was talking to my girlfriend Told her I was stressed Said I'm going off the deep end She said, God, for once, give it a rest We're all waiting in the dugout Thinking we should pitch How you gonna throw a shot out When all you do is bitch I got nothing to lose There's nothing to gain It's like a one-way ticket to cruise in the passing lane And I can't complain I got a brand new dance Give it one more shot Gonna be a brand new man This time I won't get caught I'm Gonna take my last stand This time I can't be bought Then again on the other hand How much you got? I got nothing to lose It's nothing to gain It's like a one-way ticket to cruise in the passing lane and I can't complain A little out of time A little out of tune Sort of lost in space Chasing that moon Climbing the walls Of a hurricane Still overall I can't complain 
How about you all? I can't complain. Thanks. Today's episode of On the Porch Radio Hour is brought to you by oil lamps. Evidence of the first oil lamp can be traced back to 70,000 B.C. Starting with moss soaked in animal fat and lit in a clamshell, the oil lamp has evolved into that glass-globed, oil-filled antique that's fun to display. But the oil lamp can be so much more. As a culture, we love mass-produced items. They are inexpensive and help us get our needs met. But did you know that oil lamps were the first mass-produced item in history? Henry Ford was not a revolutionary when it came to the assembly line. Imagine with me, if you can, 100 Egyptians in a line forming clay into uniform shapes and then stacking them to dry in the sun. And once that sun set, light was still readily available, thanks to oil lamps. So the next time you think that folks that don't use electricity are out of touch, think about those folks playing cards in a well-lit room while you sit in your window trying to read by cloud-covered moonlight because your power went out. Playing cards with your family is healthier, more fulfilling, and more fun than a headache from strained eyes. This means you and your family are healthier, fulfilled, and more fun because of oil lamps. Oil lamps, healthy, fulfilling, fun. Shedding light on every situation since 70,000 B.C. Now that's a tradition you can't compete with. Oil lamps. Oh no. What's the matter? I, I just remembered it's mom's birthday. Really? Really? We're hanging off a sheer rock face and you're thinking about mom's birthday? Uh, right. Sorry. I'm just trying not to focus on the fact that we're hanging from a sheer rock face. Isn't that the whole reason for being here? To be in the moment, to focus on the now? Yeah. Right now is mom's birthday. Right, but can't we talk about it and call when we get back to the park lodge? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> do, you, do you remember that time she tried to bake you a cake for your birthday and caught the inside of the oven on fire? And then she tried to redo it and shattered the pan on the stove top? <laughs> I could die if I slip. Oh, mm, right. <clears throat> How about when dad... Oh, dude, shut your mouth. I need to concentrate. Fine. Fine. <laughs> oh, please don't tell me you're crying It's just that You've never respected me Really? We're hanging by our fingertips A hundred feet above jagged rocks And you want to talk about me respecting you? It's, it's just that I thought you would appreciate me If we came on this trip And we could bond and talk Like siblings should that's fine. When we're back in the lodge and enjoying some wine and dinner after this awesome climb, not during the most deadly part of this climb. You're always avoiding deeper connection. Fine. You want to talk about childhood? How about the time our canoe tipped and we had to swim 200 yards back to shore in four foot waves and lightning, and all you wanted to do was talk about how you felt like we'd grown apart? Or the time we were trapped in our tent and family, in a family of bears and you wanted to discuss how you felt Dad was taking a lot of out-of-town business trips. Why do you do this? Okay, stop yelling. Jeez. I'm trying to get over this ledge to the top. Ah, uh, phew. We've made it. <sighs> yeah, that was awesome. Great climb. Shall we rappel down and go get that wine and dinner? I don't know. Do you want to talk about anything first? What? No. <laughs> You and your need for being sentimental. Can't we just be in the moment and celebrate our accomplishment without getting all mushy? I am never going on an adventure with you again. Jeez. Stop being so uptight. For the last six years, Lisa Emmons has been operating and running her shop 
Mother Earth Baby, which provides more than just products and uh, materials for families and their kids. They provide... Uh, workshops and classes and she's been part of conferences and is supporting the community. I'm really glad to have you here on the porch. Thanks for being here, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me. I wanted to start actually by hearing you talk about your motivation to not just open the shop, but to to provide everything that you're providing for the community. Well, this goes way back. I grew up uh, in living, literally living in a health food store. My mom uh, is a small business owner herself, is currently running a health food store called Mother Earth Health Foods, originally opened by my grandmother in 1969. So yeah, yeah, quite a while. They were doing health food when health food wasn't popular. Right. Yeah. So I grew up eating organic and being mindful of the environment and that's who I am and it's always been in me and I went to school to be a social worker and worked in that field for many years. I um, worked in a number of uh, different positions for about 14 years and after a while I decided I wanted to do something else and had a passion for helping people in a different way and I think the turning stone there was the birth of our daughter that was our third child oh, sure. and really just embraced cloth diapers uh, with all of our kids embraced cloth diapers and breastfeeding natural parenting and uh, it was that point in time when we really wanted to make a change and I think one day you know, I was working full time and Nathan filed my husband filed for the business and surprised me because <laughs> we had been talking about it for so long and he made it happen and so it wasn't it was a couple years later I uh, quit my job and decided to work full time for the business. That's really yeah. Yeah. fantastic. What an awesome story and and an <laughs> awesome history too to have been brought up in that. So you mm-hmm. had a lot of firsthand knowledge and experience in in seeing what worked and how you could adapt that to the things you wanted to do. Yeah. As you started your business and you were getting people in and you were getting Mm -hmm. information out there and 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 informing people about all the things that you were providing when did you start doing more than just selling materials because i Mm -hmm. i know that you've been providing a lot of information and and workshops that's something we do i i believe i do that first and foremost before selling product Mm -hmm. is my consultation and education I'm a strong advocate for cloth diapers, number one, because environmentally, I think it makes sense. I think for people's budgets, it makes sense. And um, for our family, it made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. You know, we we educate and um, we also, um, I'm I'm a strong advocate for breastfeeding as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Breastfed all my children. One of the goals I've had for a few years is becoming a La La Leche League leader. And that's something I accomplished a couple months back. And you know, going to be opening up a group in Oswego County for moms who are breastfeeding to receive some uh, mom-to-mom support. Yeah. And it's something that our county hasn't had for about four years now. And it's something, ever since I found out we didn't have a group, I've been wanting to make that happen. So uh, we see a lot of moms come into our store who really do want that support and really do want that connection. We always have had a rocking chair in our store and a nice place where moms can come in and spend a couple hours and do what they need to do, whether it's talk, sit, cry. (laughs) So it's, it's, it's a nice place where moms feel comfortable bringing their children. And I hear over and over again, moms are so happy that there's a place where they feel welcome, their children feel welcome. And, um, that's, that's important to us. Yeah, that's yeah. really fantastic. Yeah. And you're not just providing that space in your shop either. When we went to uh, Simu during the um, mm-hmm. during their Christmas break, we noticed that you had a, a, a sponsored a section, I guess, mm-hmm. um, where moms could go and breastfeed and, and have some of that time. I, I think that's really important too. And it's nice to know that you're you're reaching out and that there's people that are embracing that mm-hmm. too. Uh, are you doing that in um, in other venues? Is is you know, are you able to provide other spaces like that? We do. Um, Harbor Fest every year, we okay. provide a tent down at the Children's Park. And um, it's a tent where we provide a changing table and a rocking chair and some coloring activities. Mm-hmm. 
where um, moms can go and just take a break out of the sun and sit and have a comfortable spot. And we hear year after year that it's enjoyed and appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. What other kind of, um, or I shouldn't say what other, but are you doing other things like that? Are you providing information or space for other Mm -hmm. pieces too, other than breastfeeding? We provide the space for the breastfeeding. We Mm -hmm. also provide space for uh, people who want to come in and maybe talk about different things or or gain some education. Um, We've had classes on essential oils. We've had classes on healthy plastics for kids. We've had um, lots of different things that we've done throughout the years. One of our, one of our big things now is, is we, we plan a Healthy Baby Expo every year. And okay. this is in conjunction with the Great Cloth Diaper Change. And so we've been growing that quite a bit. And that's just a big, it's an opportunity where we bring a lot of folks in with a lot of different expertise. We do different workshops at that event, just have a lot of activities for children. And it's a free event for anybody. We just we just want to celebrate cloth diapers and natural parenting and <laughs> have a fun activity for families. Yeah. So that's that's evolved over the last few years. Nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, when is that? Uh, when is that event? Um, the Healthy Baby Expo this year is April eighteenth. Okay. Yep. And um, it's going to be at Elam Grace Church. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're looking for vendors and um, looking for people who want to participate. Also. You know, looking for people who want to help break a world record by changing the most babies into cloth diapers. Yeah, (laughs) I think that's so much fun. (laughs) Now, when you started six years ago, you had a shop. um, Was your first shop was on the back of um, the build? Water uh, Water Street. Water Street, sure. You were there for how long before you moved? Let's see. We moved. We opened that storefront in 2011, Black Friday, and mm-hmm. I think we moved February 2013. So about a year and a half. Yeah. So we've been in our current location for about two years now, right? Yeah. Sure. It was a while before we opened up a storefront. We first opened up our business online. Okay. And because we were working, we were both working full time at the time. So right. it, it only started out as a hobby just because we enjoyed cloth diapers so much and right. I wanted to have them available to people. So um, that was just our way. That's how we started the business was online. And in my mom's health food store, she made a space for us that we could sell our products cool. and make them available. So that's kind of how we started. And then when we got... When we grew big enough, we decided it was time to open up a storefront, and we live in Oswego and thought that that was the perfect place to open a store. I agree. Mm-hmm. I agree. And you are enjoying your new space? We love it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mentioned that uh, I grew up in a health food store because our, our house was attached to the store. Okay. And so when my mom was working... I was also home, and uh, we have the same situation now. We live and work in the same building, mm-hmm. and so our kids can come and go, and yeah. it's fun. It's It makes owning a business and being busy uh, just a little bit easier. It does. So what else in the, you know, in the near future, uh, say up until Harbor Fest, what can people be expecting from Mother Earth Baby this year? Well, uh, we're, we're pretty active in the community. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we, in addition to our store, um, you know, I serve on a number of committees, so I'm out and about. We sell a lot of different products uh, that really meet a lot of needs in the community from the breastfeeding products to the cloth diapers to um, other natural baby products to toys and we've expanded to toys Um, uh, there's just so much that our store offers and we really grow our products by request from customers that what customers are looking for is what we tend to get in the store and so you know we're always looking for opportunities to partner in the community and um, continue to provide the best service and product that product that we can we offer a cloth diaper service so we're always out and about and really give our customers that door-to-door treatment um you know when when we uh 
deliver diapers or you know a lot of folks will order stuff and then we'll deliver to their door so we we just try to meet the needs of every customer as as they come up yeah and it, it, mm-hmm. it seems like you're doing a, a great job of that and i i think it's great how involved you guys are in the community and, and it's it's nice to see that happening <laughs> so tell us then the best way for people to be able to be in touch with you to find out what you're doing to be part of your event mm-hmm. coming up how, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, uh, we have a very active Facebook page, and I'm always chatting, and uh, customers can message me at 11 o'clock, and oftentimes I will respond <laughs> at 11 o'clock. Um, not always, but um, I do respond pretty quickly whenever anybody needs anything. So um, our Facebook page uh, is a great way to contact us. Also, the store, uh, mm-hmm. our phone number is 315-216-4622. And uh, our website uh, has a nice uh, contact us page where people can email me directly from there or email me at lisa at mebabyshop.com, M-E-B-A-B-Y-S-H-O-P.com. Perfect. And you're on Bridge Street now, West Bridge, right? We're on West Bridge Street and uh, 70 West Bridge Street, not far from the hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're open six days a week, uh, Monday through Friday, 10 to 6, and Saturdays, 10 to 5, and we take Sundays off. (laughs) Good for you. (laughs) You deserve it. (laughs) Thanks so much for all your hard work and for coming on the show and and, uh, doing everything that you're doing in the community. You're welcome. Awesome. It was a pleasure. It was, and still is. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Uh, Lisa Emmons, Mother Earth Baby, everybody. Thank you. Good? You're listening to On the Porch Radio Hour. Before we take our break, we are in the middle of growing what we're doing here at Wooden Apple Farmstead, and especially with On the Porch Radio Hour. We're bringing in some really great guests. We have incredible music every week. You can catch us every Thursday in several different ways, and you can catch us uh, the Saturday after every Thursday show. And there's a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of hours being put into the radio show, and we're getting a lot of support from our uh, friends and our community in supporting our local community, and we want to thank everybody for that. And we want to be able to keep providing everything that we're doing. And so there are ways that you can help if you are a community member or a business owner and you're interested in finding out how you can sponsor on the porch radio hour if you want to find out ways that you can help us support our community you can get a hold of us on facebook or at our website and you can find out all of the details and how you can help sponsor us and how you can help us keep supporting the community that we are living in See you in a few minutes. What's happening in central New York is brought to us by iHeart Oswego. Fantastic Architectures, an exhibit of student work in foundation design, is open Wednesday through Saturday through March 6. SUNY Oswego student artists and designers created mixed media drawings that experiment with line, shape, value, color, texture, and scale. Call 315-216-4985 for more information. Circle Mirror Transformation is a SUNY Oswego Honors production running through March 7. When four lost New Englanders who enroll in a community center's drama class begin to experiment with harmless games, hearts are quietly torn apart and tiny wars of epic proportions are waged and won. Call 315-312-2141 for more information. CNY Arts Center hosts a writer's cafe the last Sunday of the month and is currently offering adult painting classes and presents a dessert theater series continuing March 21st with John, his story. Visit cnyartscenter.com for more information. The Baldwinsville Theater Guild presents Jekyll and Hyde, the musical. The show runs for seven performances beginning Friday, March 13. Visit www.baldwinsvilletheaterguild.org for more information. The Syracuse Improv Collective presents The Bank Show on March 6th at 8 p.m., an evening of improv and musical acts at the CNY Playhouse in Shoppingtown Mall. 
The CNY Playhouse also hosts Don't Feed the Actors, one of Central New York's longest-running improv troupes on March 7 at 8 p.m. Visit cnyplayhouse.com for more information. The Oswego Music Hall presents an open mic night Friday, March 6 at 7 p.m. and the Kevin McCrell Band on Saturday, March 7 at 7.30 p.m. Visit oswegomusichall.org for more information. The Red Room Sessions at the Wooden Apple Farmstead are a time for songwriters, musicians, and anyone else who wants to build their musical skill and knowledge to get together. We share songs we are working on, bounce musical ideas off each other, and we usually have time to just play a little music. This is a supportive environment where all levels of songwriting and musical experience are welcome. It is the final Sunday of each month. The next session is March 29th at 6 p.m. Self-titled Oswego's Most Slowly Emerging Artist, Mark Warner has been performing all around Oswego. Uh, He's been a steady performer at Old City Hall's Open Mic for more than 25 years on Tuesday nights. He's been playing in Dos Locos with Brian Mosier and has been performing with The Predators with Mosier, Tim Stone, Heimer Morgan, and... John Blotch. John Blotch. Thank you. I should have asked that yeah. first. So it was John Vulture and the Predators was the name of the band. John Vulture and the Blatch Predators. the drummer from that's we go. Awesome. Yeah. And so I want to welcome Mark Warner to the porch. Thanks for being here, Mark. Thanks for having me, Matt. It's great to be here. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, man. Yeah. So you Mark, remember Brian Mosier. He worked with us at Yap. I sure do. I, Matt and I and Gene all worked together many years ago. Yeah. And I was actually just going to say, when I first met Mark, uh, it was not as a musician. It was probably only a week after I met Mark the first time that I learned he was a musician. Uh, But the first time I met Mark, I sat across a desk from him to answer questions like, what is your favorite animal? To which I replied, a spider. To which Mark then followed up with, why would you ever kill a spider? And I had to answer that question. (laughs) I I don't think that's what I said. That's, That's a, how I remember it. I adopted because somebody used it on me once. They ask what your least favorite animal is, and mm. then say, if your least favorite animal were here in the room, what would you do? Ah. And your answer to that question says a lot about your nature. I see. So I think that's what I Maybe that's to. where I was going with that. Because I was like, geez, I don't think I'd ever kill a spider. Maybe I that's where I was. I wasn't suggesting that anyone should kill spiders anymore <laughs> at any time. I, I'm all right with if you do. I'm just not... <laughs> That's supporting the effort, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> this is much how my interview went, I think. And, and, and your career. And my career, along yeah. Along with us. It was, <laughs> yeah. A fun, it was a good time. It was a good time. For a good purpose. That's right. So we worked together for, for a few years, and I got to know Mark as a person, as a good friend, Absolutely. and and as a musician. And it's, uh, it's really great to actually have you on the show as a musician. It's funny to hear people describe me as a musician, because it's one of the smaller elements of what I consider my whatever I am to be. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But it's true, and I, and I used it at Yap, which is where we worked in it. I've had a pretty long career in human services, and I've always brought music into it as much as I could, kind of selfishly because it gave me an opportunity to have a guitar at work and play mm-hmm. the guitar at work and be online looking up lyrics. We ran uh, some, some uh, groups with kids and got them guitars and got them started and um it's been great you know all of it's been good but it's 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 a smaller part of of my roles it's really neat to see how you involve it in in everything that you're doing and and i also remember during my interview the first time that we met your desk was sitting next to a group of shelves and on those shelves and i'll never forget as a picture of you standing on the side of a highway what looked like a highway there's a road and you're standing next to your motorcycle that had a backpack and a guitar yeah tied to the back of it and yeah. then you you went on to explain during my interview how you had been uh traveling the country yeah that photo was uh next to the pecos river oh i had actually in in 93 before i went to work at yap uh just before actually i'd uh arranged over several years an opportunity to take an entire year off and tour the country on a honda 750 with a tent and a guitar and no plan whatsoever except to go to mexico which i did and to visit my nephew on kodiak island in alaska which i also did so that was a a crazy year that you heard probably heard a lot about because it was Mm -hmm. very it had it was very 
it's, it seems a long, like another lifetime ago now, but it was probably fresh in all my mind and thinking back then. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I, I recommend it. I like to tell the kids though. I I had uh, graduated from college and bought my own house, as it were. It was a trailer on a lot, but it's like don't just quit everything you're doing and run off. Like get yourself settled and and decide what you want to do, and then take a little bit of time and go look around. Yeah, <laughs> right. That's good advice. Yeah. That's don't good everybody advice. buy a motorcycle tomorrow and ride out of town. <laughs> <laughs> I left in October. And the first thing I did was, you know, right down, down <laughs> south, it was already getting pretty cold. And I spent most of the winter in a place called Bisbee, Arizona, which is uh, the first place I actually played, performed in front of people, which was great because I was leaving town, whether I was good or bad or indifferent, I could be a rock. It wasn't like playing in your hometown where you're going to face people the next day and see them at the store and they're going to go, oh, I saw what you did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? It's like, I'm leaving town. See, everybody, it's been great. <laughs> but... Uh, it, it helped helped uh, start some confidence for me, and when I it wasn't until I came back in mid '90s that I started performing locally and let anybody know that I even played or tried to play. Yeah, yeah. What a great way to to dive into it and really test it out and see if it's for you. Yeah, you know? yeah. It was a great opportunity to very anonymously, you know, be whatever I thought I could be. You've moved on since then through different jobs and uh through different places and and have met a whole bunch of different people and you know your music still stays with you absolutely yeah and 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 has brought me into a whole new world like all of your other guests and my current job now i work with the arc of oswego county and work with people challenged by disability and their families and greg grassblock within the last year came to work at our sister agency oswego industries and We've become good friends. We met actually at the open mic in Oswego prior to meeting at work <laughs> and like introduced ourselves. And then I saw him at work one day and went, oh, you're working here. Huh? Uh, I met Mark Wall through the open mics many years ago. This is a, one of his guitars. He's a, one of my very best friends in the world and co-conspirator. And uh, John McConnell, I'd been playing at the open mic for many years before John McConnell came and played and started to host it. And we're the best of friends and um, just all very supportive of each other and all very happy you know very it's it's, it's just a really oswego to me and i i kind of wrote you some bible notes but mm-hmm. and when i was a kid like growing up everybody in town played music i did and i had a truck and i learned <laughs> a, i learned eq i was i was doing uh, max's work and uh, running cables and packing gear and moving around and pretty happily but it was always supportive it was always, we always had great quality and and great support. You know, everybody was was ready to back anything anybody else was trying to do. And I was very proud of our community and remain proud of our community for that. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if if music was influenced at, at all by your, um, you know, during your grade school times. Because you spent a lot of time on SUNY Oswego's campus. I did. I, I lived a block from Sheldon Hall. My folks moved here in the 50s. Um, to go to work. My dad went to work at the college and my mom started teaching then in Hannibal grade school. But I went to the campus school, which was a uh, elementary school on the college campus in the middle of what's the the art, the student center now, the big long building. Mm-hmm. It's indiscernible, the old building that we used to go to. But in fourth grade, our teacher, Helen Benjamin, who lived down the street from me, had the custodian build a wooden rack along one side of her classroom into which were placed, I want to say, 20 or 25 plastic ukuleles with nylon strings. And mm-hmm. every day we would have a music session where we would... Wow given the ukes and some percussive instruments and for about 45 minutes we would sing traditional songs folk songs if i had a hammer Mm -hmm. uh tally me banana like all these you know songs of the 60s i'm talking about late 60s there and uh then I would take the uke and do a Beatles songs and James Taylor songs <laughs> yeah. and some Elvis songs. And I loved it. I, I always, you know, I was always uh, campus school. Kids remember me from the ukulele, really. But then it went away until 1980 when I started college and bought a guitar and almost failed guitar class and <laughs> put it away again for about eight years. And then got, I'm really old. <laughs> <laughs> If we can but learn yeah. anything else, you know. <laughs> but Helen Benjamin was was a great, you know, it was great that she was able to do that and did that. And um, I made a deal with my dad that if I played, if I really uh, applied myself to it, that he would get me my own baritone ukulele on my birthday, which 
he did that year. My birthday, sadly for him, is December 30th, and he was a procrastinator. So on <laughs> December 30th of the year, I turned six or so. He drove me to House of Guitars through a blinding snowstorm, which oh took several hours, <laughs> and bought me about a $50 harmony baritone ukulele that Bill Noun now has. If everybody anybody out there knows Bill Noun, the uh, principal from the high school that used to sing his uke on the mic wore out his uke, and I had the same thing, and I've, uh, he's now playing mine uh, nice. around the county, so it lives on. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. yeah, I'd never heard any of that part of of your story and and having that musical experience and i think that it's a really good example of of how introducing music into our community and introducing music to kids is really just so beneficial and and you know if they put an instrument down maybe they don't pick another one up for another eight years but they're more likely to pick one up and i think it's so important and it, there's, you know, it's just music's always had an, a, a great effect on me. It can change my mood. It always could. You know, the right song changes the, changes everything. You know, there's a soundtrack to our lives that we that we get to have. That's right. And then music, of course, is like any other art form. It's risky. You know, you're putting yourself out and saying, "Here's something I'm, I'm proud of and and feel good about, and I'm gonna, you know, let other people see." Yeah, um, and there's always risk in that, and that's good. You know, I lo- that's probably the most exciting part of it for me is that feeling of risk when you perform. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And what a great segue to to talk about how, you know, performing music is kind of opening yourself up and letting people see another piece of you, um, which is a huge risk, yeah. and and taking a risk and and telling our stories and however we want to do that. And so I'm going to kind of let that transition us into your into your next song, song. you have another song for I do. Us that i'm really excited I, i'm gonna about. just say one thing yeah, quickly please. about this um I've, i'm not a songwriter in fact i've i described myself before i was and by the way the the slowly most slowly emerging artist was because i was asked to be on the emerging artist showcase last year of the <laughs> of the music hall for the finale yeah. since then i've called myself as we go most slowly emerging artist but um I don't write songs. I don't. Uh, I've had. I've. I've intended to write songs many times, and just. I, I just haven't felt it. But I do interpret songs. I have a mm-hmm. great number of singer songwriters that I love, and I tend to bring forward songs that aren't hits and aren't widely recognized, but that speak to me in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, the exception to that was many years ago when I was going to a friend's birthday party. Um, and it was John Luber, who was a great friend of mine and a great mentor and uh, responsible for a lot of my musical interests and tastes. He had a beautiful house out on the lake, and he had a party that was all musicians and all of whom brought instruments and played at a bonfire, many of whom wrote their own stuff. And I wrote this song 15 years ago um, on a day when I was uh, destroying an old house trailer on my property, which yeah. would become clear as I sang. <clears throat> and... Uh, it was as a joke, but it kind of took on its life of its own and has a, a whole subculture around it now of Oswego fans that have fortunately grown to appreciate it and ask for it. But it's the, uh, I always introduce it as the sorrowful semi-autobiographical tale of love and pre-manufactured housing gone bad. And it's called Trailer of Love. <laughs> left me, my life was filled with heartache, didn't even pause long enough to set the handbrake, our home was real, but we yanked it down the hill, them six big wheels, and now I'm left here. Smashing up our trailer of love I failed to bust the walls of your denial But the trailer of love walls ain't much more than vinyl It won't pass code So we can't even haul the heap over the road The D.O.T. will certify our trailer of love 
trailer of love That trailer full of hopes and desires The hitch was good But there wasn't any air in the tires Small but big enough to keep our love in Like the stuff that grew behind the oven There was a slow decay And in the end the whole frame just rotted away The bottom fell out on us and from our trailer of love Trailer of love That trailer full of hopes and desires The hitch was good But there wasn't any air in the tires Now the fire consumes the paneling of baronial walnut Thought that they would stand for all of time, but walls fell away. Now there's a big pile of sheet metal, white and gray. We both got unscrewed when I ripped apart the trailer of love. Trailer of love. That trailer full of hopes and desires The hitch was good But there wasn't any air in the tires When you left me My life was filled with heartache I didn't even pause long enough To set the handbrake Our home was real, but we yanked it down the hill Them six big wheels And now I'm left here, smashing up our trailer of love For fifteen long years, I lived inside the trailer of love Aluminum wiring in the hot, dangerous trailer of love Sure came apart easy That small gray and white trailer of love Thank you. Gina and I are going to perform a John Prine song together. <laughs> Long time, no matter how hard I try. 
like a broken down dam. Make me an angel that flies from Montgomery. Make me a poster for the whole rodeo. Just give me one thing that I can hold on to. To believe in this living is just a hard way to go. And I ain't done nothing since I woke up today How the hell can a person go to work in the morning Come home in the evening and have nothing to say Make me an angel that flies from Montgomery Make me a poster of an whole rodeo just give me one thing that I can hold on to To believe in this living is just a hard way to go Make me an angel that flies from Montgomery Make me a poster of an old rodeo Just give me one thing that I can hold on to even this living is just a hard way to go. Even this living is just a hard way to go. Beautiful, Gina. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. This public service announcement is brought to you by the World Health Organization. There's a compound that's making a resurgence out on the streets. Dihydrogen monoxide, better known as water. Kids all over central New York are being caught with water in their homes, in schools, even at daycare. Please be aware, adults are telling our children that drinking water will prevent constipation, keep them healthy, and even prevent dehydration. Professionals are suggesting that we provide ample amounts of alternative beverage, such as soda, powdered beverages, and sugary drinks. These will counteract the effects of water until officials can clean the streets from this compound. If your child shows signs of energy, happiness, joy, or even seems content, they may be drinking water. Consult your local Slurpee vendor and provide your child with copious amounts of mouth and face staining beverages. And then please observe and repeat as needed. Our children need your help. Our children need to be clean of water. This public service announcement is brought to you by the World Health Organization. You caught me breathing a little slower You caught me needing a little more the good fight but I fought it harder and you stayed up all night while I slept longer I gave up thinking I'd find a reason meaning changes with every season and they 
but you end up bleeding the words I love you are lost in their screaming and the bridge is sturdy but I feel it swinging and I know I'll get there if I believe it you say you If I was stronger, and you fight the good fight, but I fight it harder, and you say you're not fine, and why do I bother, and the bridge will hold me, but I feel it sweet. But I fight it harder Thank you on the porch, music director Gina Holsapple. November 12th, 2004, two days before the opening of the SpongeBob movie. This day is the day that went down in Tonka Hogan history as the great SpongeBob heist. Three Tonka Hogan residents, Marty Devereaux, Kevin Montag, and Patrick Cleaver Hook, all went to the Statistics and Analytics of Township Management Conference. And of course, that conference took them out of town. Way out of town. And it was far enough out of town that they believed they could cut loose a little, let go, have a little fun. And if you've ever been to any kind of statistics or analytics conference, you know that you need to be able to cut loose and have a little fun. They were feeling it was a little dry the second night of being at this four-night conference. And they wanted to they wanted to spice it up a little bit. So the first night, there was music. There was a bar in the hotel at, at the conference. And there was music, and, and they enjoyed the music. And the second night, there was nothing. So they sat in their hotel room, and they played cards, and they talked about what was on the schedule for the next day. And then they started discussing the placement of the bar in relation to the counter which was then discussed in how far the counter and the bar were in relation to a roughly six to seven foot cardboard cutout of SpongeBob SquarePants. Apparently this hotel and the movie SpongeBob were working together. So the hotel was promoting the new SpongeBob movie with this six to seven foot cardboard cutout. And they decided that what else are you going to do at a hotel when you're there for a statistics and analytics conference and you want to try to spice things up when it's getting a little dry and you have access to a six to seven foot cardboard cutout of SpongeBob SquarePants. They decided there was nothing else they could do but to sneak it into one of their co-workers' vans and see how far they could get. So not only did they launch the plan... But the plan included many incredible things. So they had to create a diversion, which included not only distracting the other conference goers, but distracting the young man working behind the counter. And they'd noticed that there were periods of time after 8 p.m. that this young man would disappear. He'd go into the back room behind the counter. Maybe he would go check the vending machine. He liked to use the bathroom that was a good 20 feet down the hall. And they tracked his movements. It was the second night. There was no entertainment. People were just walking around. Why not leave the card game and go track the young man behind the counter? Then they figured out that they needed to figure out if he was working the next night. 
So they struck up a conversation. And sure enough, he was on that schedule, and he would be there at the same time. So they watched, and they figured him out. And then they figured out the movement in and out of the bar. And they noticed how drastically different movement in and out of the bar was compared to the night before when there was a musician. So they looked at the conference schedule, and sure enough, no musician, no entertainment, nobody in the bar to bring attention. However, like the giant SpongeBob cutout, there was always a whiteboard sitting outside the bar. And it's not hard to find a whiteboard dry erase marker at a conference. So the next day, they started putting their plan into motion. They had to get to the whiteboard. They had to have a whiteboard marker. They had to have flyers. They weren't sure they could get flyers, but they knew they could mark it. They could sell anything they wanted to, and they were going to sell entertainment in the bar, even though there wasn't going to be entertainment in the bar. So how do you get folks at a statistics conference to go to a bar thinking there's entertainment? Well, you entice them with Uncle Shecky and his incredible oboe playing. And that's what they did. They got the whiteboard marker and they wrote, Coming tonight at the bar, 9 o'clock, Uncle Shecky and his incredible oboe playing. What else? And then they tracked the young man behind the counter. And they studied SpongeBob and they could see the folds in the cardboard. And they were going to be able to fold up SpongeBob in three places get him under an arm, and get him out to their co-worker's van. But there was a hitch. They had to get their co-worker's keys. And that was easy enough, because they could convince their co-worker to go on a vending machine run while they set up the poker game in the hotel room. So they got their co-worker to run down the hall to the vending machine, where they had asked a young lady with the persuasion of $10 to distract him at the vending machine. They asked her to talk to him about ice and how exciting that conference on numbers and pie graphs was, the one right before lunch. And there they were in the hall talking about pie graphs and ice. And the young man behind the counter for some reason was stuck to the counter that night. So they had to distract him too, which took one of the three of them away. But that was okay because they still had two people to fold up SpongeBob and get him out the door. And as people were milling around the dry erase board, All it took was one voice in the back of the crowd to say, Man, I haven't heard any good oboe playing since the last time I heard this Uncle Shecky. I'm going for sure. And that's all it took for them to get everybody in the bar. And they packed the place. The hall was empty. The young man behind the counter was distracted. Their co-worker was upstairs, distracted by a young woman at the vending machine. It was time to move. They popped several tabs folded up Spongebob, tucked him under an arm, somebody held the door, somebody ran, there was a flash, everything in bright yellow streaks, and pink, and and doors flying open, and people being shoved out of the way, and something about an oboe player in the bar that you had to go see, and they ran, and it was cold, but it was okay, they could see their breath, and they were pretty sure they could see Spongebob's breath, he was excited, he was going on an adventure, and they slid him into the back of the van, closed the door, and caught their breath and calmly made their way back inside. At which point, they snuck up the backside of the hotel and made their way back into the hotel room so that when their co-worker made it back into the room, everybody was there and the poker game was set up. The next morning, as everybody was meeting for breakfast, the co-worker with the van remembered that he had left his sweater in the van. And so they're all sitting at breakfast, and he comes with a weird look on his face. Hey, do you guys know anything about, you know, that whatever it is in the back of my van? What are you talking about? Was all they could, it's all they could muster up in their response. What are you talking about? Oh, I don't know. I just don't remember that being there. Well, what is it? Something cardboard. Well, did you look at it? Well, yeah, it was cardboard. So you have cardboard in the back of your van. Yeah, I guess you're right. And that's where they left it. And on the last day of the conference, they believed that the young man behind the counter looked puzzled as he glanced down the hall where there used to be a bright yellow sign or something. There was something there, but he couldn't remember. 
and they made that long drive home and they were all tired from their four days. And as they pulled into the driveway and they were dropping off everybody to get into their cars and to make their own way back home, from the back of the van, they were certain that they could hear SpongeBob SquarePants singing, This This is is my home. This This is my only home. This This is is the only sacred ground that I have ever known. Should I stray in the dark night alone? Rock me, goddess, in the gentle arms of Eden. Rock me, goddess, in the gentle arms of Eden. This has been another exciting episode of On the Porch Radio Hour. I want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank Mark Warner for bringing all of his excellent energy and his music. And I want to thank Lisa Emmons from Mother Earth Baby for joining us and sharing. And I want to thank everybody that was watching on Concert Window. And I want to thank the audience that was here at the Wooden Apple Farmstead. I want to thank you for listening on our website and I want to thank everybody for being so supportive of our community and being part of our community. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next Thursday on the Porch Radio Hour. Have a great night. On the Porch is a production of the Wooden Apple Farmstead with host Matthew Wood. Our musical director is Gina Holsoff. Our stage manager is Ray Monet. Our sound technician is Maxwell Wood. Contributing writers for the show include Matthew Wood. Special guests include Mark Warner and Lisa Emmons. Find information about past shows, being on the porch, and much more online at ontheporch.weebly.com.